Hi there, and welcome to One Idea Away. Not just a podcast, but a community and ongoing conversation meant to inspire and empower individuals to live more fully, deeply, and consciously. Let's jump into today's episode right now. Today, let's steal a page from Simon Sinek, and let's start with why. Although I'm going to ask it in a little bit different way. You see, this is not just simply going to be around this idea of why do we do what we do in terms of the purpose, the meaning, the values that we have, although we will get to some of that. Where I really want to begin, what I really want to start with is why do we believe what it is that we believe and how is it that that really begins to affect our life. You see, so many of us, we have a life philosophy, we have a belief system that we have never really truly dove into to understand, well, that's exactly why I believe that, because it gets handed down to us in so many different ways, whether that's our parents or society and education and all these different places that influence us. So today we're going to get into that conversation, and we're going to get into it with the authors of The Pragmatist's Guide to Life, Simone and Malcolm Collins. You see, they put together this guide, the Pragmatist Guide, which is a process that they've outlined for taking ownership over your beliefs and identity. Now, Malcolm was originally a neuroscientist focused on brain-computer interface and the evolution of human cognition. He felt he could learn more about the ways humans interact with the world and each other by pursuing an MBA at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And it's there that he met Simone, his wife and the co-author of The Pragmatist Guide, who at the time was the director of marketing at HubPages.com, managing a team of over 20,000 freelancers. Now, together, they went on to co-found the art commission marketplace, ArtCorgi.com, after which Malcolm became the director of strategy at South Korea's most desired source of early-stage capital, while Simone earned her graduate degree from Cambridge. The couple now runs a number of travel companies, splitting their time between North America and Miami and South America, really doing some truly phenomenal work. This is going to be a really interesting conversation I've been looking forward to bringing to you. Let's join the interview now. Simone and Malcolm, thank you so much for joining us here on One Idea Away. It is so wonderful to be here with you. I appreciate it. Now, uh, I think maybe one of the things, one of the distinctions that we want to make up front, we get into a number of different professional fields and bring in from different fields of research and topics and interests that are out there. And one of those fields that we bring up uh, with right now seems like a little bit more seeming frequency is positive psychology. And now, Malcolm, based on your background, because you have a varied background in a number of different fields, and I wanted you to just speak a little bit about maybe how you view things from the positive psychology realm and how some of what you do may differ from that. So our, our nonprofit in the book that, that um, uh, results from it, The Pragmatist Guide to Life, is very much a sort of weird offshoot of positive psychology, but very differentiated from mainstream positive psychology. Whereas positive psychology is really focused around maximizing sort of positive emotional states. Um, and there's even a sub branch of positive psychology built around maximizing the feeling of fulfillment. Right. We are 100 percent focused on utilizing psychology and neuroscience to maximize your ability to functionally fulfill what you want to fulfill without necessarily maximizing the emotional state of fulfillment. OK. We also are very different in that. while a lot of positive psychology is about using neuroscience and psychological tools to make yourself the best iteration of yourself. Mm -hmm. We are about deciding what you believe has value in the world and what you believe you want to do in life and then erasing yourself and recreating a new entity designed to be better than your current iteration at achieving those goals. Excellent. So the the focus then, because I know this is going to be a heart of, of a lot of our conversation, is around how we maximize what you guys have have, have termed as the objective function, meaning that how is it we really, really, truly live into what we place as the, you know, the, the guiding point for, for what we are trying to create within this life. Some would call that purpose. I know that's part of the conversation we're going to get into mm -hmm. and that you use that and the understanding you have for human conditioning, uh, human psychology to be able to help people understand how do we recreate ourselves to orient towards that as opposed to just absorbing all of the different influences and experiences that, that kind of are thrust upon us and shape us typically unconsciously. Do I have that right? That's right. Excellent. So with that in mind, with that as a little bit of a backdrop, 
let's begin in a completely different direction. <laughs> and, and that is that is that you guys have a really, really, really interesting story. You know, it wasn't just that you met at business school, but you guys go on a really interesting first date. And I know that if we want the reality of this, we've got to turn to you, Simone. We've got it. We've got to turn to your perspective of what was this first date because it kicks off really what brought us here today. Oh, gosh. Well, as set up, we both came into the first date, I think, in a way that's not typical for most people. So I had turned 24 in the year 2012 and decided that year that I would fall in love and have my heart broken because up to that point, I was a virgin. I had only kissed one person before in my life. I had never dated anyone before. I just couldn't be bothered with it to be honest. And I, I wanted to live alone forever, but I also knew that to have a fully balanced and actualized life, I needed to experience love and loss. So I just made that a goal and I'd say I'd check it off. And then I could explain to people that I had experienced love, but simply found it underwhelming. So, <laughs> just get back to your real life. Get exactly. it out of the way. No, it was one of those things, you know, you're like a bucket list, you know, got to go skydiving. Okay. I did that. You know, got to travel around the world. Okay. I did that. Okay. Now I got to fall in love. Check. Okay. So that's what I was doing. I, I created a, a points based system to, to gamify myself into dating. Um, so I, I competed against my coworkers in terms of getting certain milestones in with dates because I knew that, that would get me out there. I created a points based system for determining whether someone was worth a second date because I was too much of a coward to turn people down after a first date. <laughs> um, so it was it was a very systematic method. And when I met Malcolm, I feel like in some ways I met my match and in some ways I met my destroyer mm -hmm. um, because he sat across from me on our first date. And quickly revealed to me that he, too, had a very clear purpose. He immediately said, I'm not looking to date. I'm looking to find a wife. And I probably am going to find her this fall at Stanford because that's where a very large pool of pre-vetted candidates exists. <laughs> this is great. I was, uh, very, I mean, of all the people that I dated before that point, uh, he was the only person who was direct about yeah. anything. And he was being really direct about marriage. And he he laid out his whole dating mechanisms. You know, he had this high throughput screening method where he basically dated everyone he could possibly date in the San Francisco Bay Area. And he, he gave me his whole life philosophy and what he intended to do with his whole life. And then, then he said, okay, so your turn. You know, what, <laughs> what's your purpose in life? What do you want to achieve? And I started out by giving him all the things that basically anyone at least raised in Silicon Valley like I was is going to say, which is I want to I want to be happy. I want to make other people happy and I want to reach some level of spiritual enlightenment, you know, oneness with the world, whatever. Um, and he asked me why. And I was just it, it really did shatter my reality because that was the first time anyone asked me why I wanted to do those things. It was really honestly just because that's what everyone in books implies that I want to do. And that's what everyone around me had sort of implied was the thing one wants to do. And when I looked at my life at that point, you know, the international trips I would take at least once a year, going on these pilgrimages to religious sites, you know, the Vatican City or, you know, little uh, pilgrimage villages in Japan, like, to, to, to achieve some level of enlightenment, all the charity work that I did and, and the parties that I had with friends to try to look and seem happy, it all just seemed both kind of useless because I didn't feel like I was more of a satisfied person because of those things and also really superficial because yeah. so much of it was about signaling, oh, look at me, I'm a good person, I help others, mm -hmm. I am transcendent. But not signaling it to other people, signaling to yourself. To myself, yeah. Right, that it was right. really just self-masturbatory. Um, mm -hmm. And that's so super embarrassing. Um, so he, 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 he ruined my life, sort of. <laughs> I mean, like he, he, he completely put, threw me into an existential crisis. Mm -hmm. But I, I also decided that because he intended to find his wife at Stanford and made it pretty clear that I was underqualified, that I could date him for the summer I made him promise that he would dump me and then he would get his wife at Stanford. I would learn a lot from him probably because he was a really interesting person to me. And I kind of wished that I were him. Um, and then I, you know, he would dump me, he would break my heart and I would achieve my goal for the year. Um, and we would all be happy. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, or, or fortunately, depending on, on whose perspective you're looking at, it totally backfired. We got married. Um, but more importantly, 
he he helped me through the process that we eventually came to write up in the Pragmatist's Guide to Life, where he yeah. helped me mm-hmm. for myself yeah. develop those answers to what I wanted to maximize in life. But there's the second part of the story, and it's the second part of the guide that we often don't get to, is that she, you know, after thinking through what she really wanted from life, she came and she goes, okay, I know what I want now. This is this is what I want for my life. Oh, yeah, but then I told him, and he sort of vaguely gestures towards me, and he's like, and you think you're going to achieve it like that? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, to be fair, I was very much dressed in the traditional garb of the Silicon Valley manic pixie dream girl, which is to say mm. that one day I would wear a vintage round half of a dress from the 1950s with a full petticoat. The next day I would wear a right. hot pink and, and black striped Harajuku jumpsuit complete with cat ears. Your, um, your typical hipster nonsense. Yes. And, and you know, I asked her this. Um, and she goes, oh, I, I was like, but you're not going to be able to achieve, like to achieve what you just told me you want to achieve in the world. You know, you need influence. You need wealth. Um, and she goes, yeah, but people will see me for who I am on the inside. I they'll, really said that. They'll, they'll recognize my interior talents and my work ethic. And I believed that. I really believed that. And then <laughs> Absolutely. that me to, to actually look at the, the women in the world who had positions that we're in, a, in a, the general sphere of where I wanted to be in five to 10 years. I didn't even challenge you. You came up with this on your own. I, I, I just said, well, what evidence would you need to change your mind on this? Because oh, I yeah. disagree with you on this subject. Oh, yeah. And I, guess you're I was like, like well, I'll just show you wrong. I'll just show you. Yeah. So she goes on LinkedIn and she, she looked up like the top 100 women who have achieved what she wanted to achieve. Who had not gotten there by marriage or being sexy. Uh, which is, you yeah. know, there's a lot of them who did and, that. And so she went through their haircuts, the way they look, the way they dress, their accents in YouTube videos, everything to determine their, their their educational background, everything about who they were. And she's like, these women are not like me. I, I need to rebuild myself into someone like them if I want to achieve what I have intellectually determined I find meaningful. And Malcolm mm-hmm. found this to be fascinating. So we literally sat down together and created a character sheet for, for Optimal Simone, uh, in which, you know, here's what she drinks, here's how she walks, here's how she talks, here's what she wears, here's her haircut, her makeup, and, and within like three months, you went from she was a social media manager to being the director of marketing at this company and managing twenty thousand. Yeah, after people. after making those changes, and within yeah. six years from that, then now you're CEO of a company that does over a hundred million dollars a year in sales. Like, yeah, it's it, bizarre, and I certainly and, would not have made it there yeah. if I had not changed the way that I presented myself to the public for sure. So also sure. in our book, then we outline okay, here's the strategy of thinking through that. And, and being effective, mm-hmm. because it's one thing to know what you want to maximize, but it's another thing to have a body and, and a presentation that actually executes on that. And an emotional control. You know, right. you, you can control you can change yourself into somebody who has different emotional outputs from different environmental stimuli. True. So there's I mean, there's a variety of things you guys just brought up. Number one, that's just an absolutely phenomenal story. Um, I, I, I Malcolm, congratulations. You are, let's see, the match of the destroyer and the creator of existen- existential crisis. Um, and that seems like that's only step one. So yeah. we're going we're to build into we're going to build in some other steps. But I think what what's already starting to come out and then Malcolm, I have a you know kind of a question for you in terms of, you know, kind of where did this line of thinking come from? But that. It really what you're beginning is this process of consciously investigating, why do I actually believe these things? Is it even my real belief? Once you form that, you're then starting to get into the, okay, well, how are you actually going to fulfill that? And as you go through this process and something that was very clear within the book and I, I, you know, really cool um, kind of ways of doing this that we'll talk about is consistently challenging yourself as well. So not just saying, okay, I've made that decision once, I'm gonna rest on my laurels. It's it's constantly taking a look back at, okay, is, is all of the evidence still holding true for me to believe mm-hmm. what I believe and to go and operate in the world the way that I choose to operate? So Malcolm, you show up on on kind of the this date and then you know obviously proceeding, um, I'm sorry, going forward, is that you come with a very interesting level of clarity, of deliberateness, of congruency, for who you are at that moment and how you want to live in the world. How did that line of thinking, how did that orientation come to you? So again, to differentiate was in mainstream self-help and positive psychology and stuff like that. A lot of the mainstream movement is born from research into happiness and into mm-hmm. very specific, like positive emotional states and maximizing those. 
my sort of philosophy of applying psychology to life came from research into cults and brainwashing Mm -hmm. and deprogramming extremists. Mm -hmm. Um, And it came from this idea of if these people can be programmed to be like entirely different than who they used to be, um, what if we could study and learn how that programming works yeah. But instead of allowing somebody else to program us, and I was obsessed with this as a little kid. I read every book on cults and all of the, the science behind them. Um, what if we could take the lessons from that and program ourselves mm-hmm. to be whoever we wanted to be? Mm-hmm. Um, it's like uh, in biology, you know, another field I have a lot of experience with, you know, um, one of the ways they look at genetically reprogramming cells is they take viruses, which inject a small amount of genetics into your cells and then sort of reprogram them to create more viruses. Right. What if you emptied out a virus and used it as what they call a vector? Yeah. And they put any gene you wanted to in that virus, and then you could infect yourself with this virus that changed your genes however you wanted to. But you did that on a mental level. What if you create your own vector to reprogram your own mind? And once you realize that you can have full control over who you are and who you become, then the question becomes, oh, who do I want to become? Like, do I want to make it easy to maximize my own happiness? And when you begin to realize how trivially easy it is to maximize happiness, how trivially easy it is to be happy all the time once you sort of get this code – um, then you're like, oh, I guess that's not really that important to me. Um, it's sort of like when you first learned to masturbate, you know, first you do it all day long and then you're like, huh, this, this really isn't that great anymore. I guess I should do other things with my life. Um, <laughs> the, the, and, and, and that's, that's sort of what it's, it's a, 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 and that's sort of where this comes from. And so that's, that's why I was so driven and purposeful is because as soon as you realize you get to choose who you are. Then the question really becomes this first question. Well, what am I trying to maximize? What do I really want from life? Yeah. So it's interesting because what you you started to tap into then was you started to recognize the kind of the both the human conditioning process as well as the control that that had over our you call it you know vector I'll call it maybe a delivery mechanism mm-hmm. uh, that that ultimately shapes where it is that we ultimately go. And so if we can get really, really, really clear on, on, we'll dive into what this word purpose really truly means in a moment, but if we can get clear on what that purpose is for us, the programmer, we can then start to work within the way that the program functions. Correct. Right, okay. Yeah. So just before we actually now dive into that process a bit, because I, I do want to give people a, you know, kind of a look under the hood, as it were, of some of this stuff. What would you say, what's kind of at the absolute heart that you would just, of your message, you want to make absolutely sure people take away from this dialogue? I think it would be to start thinking intentionally and taking ownership of your ideas and differentiating your ideas from the ideas that you just happen to pick up through your existence. And what feels good. You know, so often people are like, well, but this makes me happy, you know? And I'm like, well, yeah, obviously you like what makes you happy. That's the whole purpose of the emotion of happiness. That doesn't necessarily mean it's right. Yeah, there's, there's a big difference between a biological imperative that we've evolved to have, like, oh, we should eat more and we should, you know, reproduce and we should make right. sure that the tribe accepts us. Some of those things are really maladapted. Um, those those traits are maladapted to modern mm-hmm. society. Just because mm-hmm. it feels good actually doesn't mean it's good for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and this is interesting because I think just before we segue into the process, I'm just curious because I think there's, you're writing this book at a really interesting time. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from from my perspective, I'm just curious from from what you see out there. It it seems that people are more adrift at times than ever before. Many of the things that they thought they believed would lead them to whatever that happiness or that peace or that freedom or whatever they believed to be that marker doesn't seem to be panning out the way that they had hoped. And it's leaving maybe the existential crisis is is the, the, the right way to look at this or one of the ways to look at this is that there's a lot of people questioning. Wait a minute where do I really fit? What is this really all about? And I'm just kind of curious if, you know, in terms of your prompting for this book and also what you saw out in the marketplace, what was it that you were seeing? How do you see some of this lining up as to why now? Why is this needed now? 
So I look at the world today and we look at the world today and that's why, you know, we don't take any money from this book. It all goes to our nonprofit and the nonprofits, basically the mission for it. The reason why we created it is we look at society today and it feels to us like the whole world has been consumed by a cult and they don't seem to realize it. And I'm not talking about you know, the extremists. I'm not talking yeah. about the opposite political party that you hate. I'm just talking about like the collective consciousness of our society needs to be deprogrammed because it is damaging. Mm -hmm. um, and it is even more damaging than, than the ultra materialist mindset that maybe the last generation grew up with, you know, where they're like, Oh, I get happy by buying, you know, sort of the, the, anti-fight club message, then people right. took that and they all programmed themselves into this wishy-washy uh, sort of message of what they wanted from life. And now they're growing up and they're realizing how unfulfilling it all is. Yeah. Very, very much so. Very much so. So what should somebody, what should somebody know maybe before they begin this process? Because, you know, Simone, you didn't know what you were walking yourself into for, for that yep. first date, as it were. So if we were to give somebody a little bit of an expectation or, or just kind of set the bar a little bit, what, what might be something helpful for them to know as a baseline, as a starting point as we jump into this? Well, honestly, most importantly, it's not going to happen to you. You have to happen to it. And yeah. I, the problem that we see with a lot of people who show intense interest in this idea but don't have the fortitude or the discipline to follow through yeah. is they really like the idea of, of having ownership over your ideas and your life and having, you know, a life that you really own. Mm -hmm. But then they just find it so unpleasant yeah. to actually ask themselves these questions. And for the first time in their lives, truly think for themselves. Yeah. And I, I'm going to yeah. say like, I hated the process. I got really, really mad. Um, and mm -hmm. I was really uncomfortable. Um, they just kind of drop out. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to know ahead of time, this is not going to be mm -hmm. pleasant. And it's hard for you to even understand what the payoff is going to be like, because it's like seeing in a whole new spectrum of of light. And but, I think the core thing here is not asking yourself these questions. A lot of people like to see themselves as the type of person who questions themselves. Hmm. Right. Um, and so they 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 like to read these books that allow you to ask, you know, questions that don't really cause you to have to change anything important to you. Um, but, you know, sort of reaffirm what you already sort of thought the world was like. And so when you open, you know, a self-help book or a book in t designed to make you better, what provides you with positive emotions? What, what provides you with a sense of reward is when the author is saying stuff you already kind of believe. Yeah. Um, and that is not at all what we do with our book. Um, when, when, w w with our philosophy and book and everything like that, you know, we want you to retrain yourself into the type of person who receives an emotional reward when you decide to change your mind because you have found new evidence that something may be wrong about what you believe. Yeah, I think there's actually like the one of the few or maybe only bad reviews we got of the book was someone who said like, well, this book is is not good because they give all these reasons why you might exist, but then they immediately say why they might be wrong. And we're like, that's the whole point. Like you need to see both sides. You need to test your belief and see if yeah. this is really how far you want to go. We're not here to provide you with answers. Like that's yeah. not the point of the book. It's not meant to guide you down a specific pathway. Yeah. And I think the book would be more rewarding to, to read if we're like, okay, this is why everyone is wrong and here's what's right. Yeah. But that's not what we do. We say, here's why everyone is wrong. Decide for yourself what's right. And that's so unfulfilling. It's like a mystery yeah. show where they don't catch the killer. Although right. They, I, I yeah. should still say that, you know, when, when we walk readers through those thought experiments regarding their purpose, regarding their objective function, I think – uh, it is also clear to people who really do engage with those thought experiments, which objective function really fits with their personal values and, yes. and their logical thought process mm -hmm. about existence and evidence. Right. Um, because for me, it, it was really clear. And other people who've read the book who we had read it during you know, the whole review process where we were trying to make sure it was all right and we weren't missing anything. Right. Um, a lot of people wrote to us and they said, well, but you're skewed. You know, it's so obvious that that you're trying to point people towards X objective function. But each time, each time someone said that, they would say it was a different one. And that's how we kind of view, <laughs> OK, this is sufficiently balanced because to them, it's clear what yeah. their objective function is. But right, right. it's always different depending on that person. Now, you know, this that's, that's interesting because I, I actually I 
I can absolutely see that. Meaning that I can I can see at different times where uh, I was certain certain things were popping out at me within the book, and I really appreciate you sharing it that perspective of of course they are because that's clear to me. It's something that I resonate with. Whereas uh-huh. something else is going to stick out to others. And now it's okay. Well, why does that stick out to me? What does that mean? Why do I believe that? Why does it sit in where I hold intrinsic value? Uh, and that's the really intriguing process that, that this kicks off. But, mm-hmm. and I, I think maybe that's just a note for also everybody, because I, I, again, I don't want to glance by this, is that most of what you end up reading or most of what you end up agreeing with is stuff that you already believe. It fits your personal paradigm. And that that's why this book is challenging, this process is challenging, is that you're shaking the tree from the roots, not just from the, from the limbs. <laughs> yes. And it's right. And it's like, well, why is your root even where it is? <laughs> why why yeah. did you plant yourself there? Uh, and so it really, really has you go through a deep discovery process. It is not easy. This is challenging, challenging work. However, exactly as, as you guys are sharing, it has massive payoff for you individually as a person. We can't prescribe mm-hmm. to you, this is what you need to go do. You got to figure that out for yourself. I, I, I appreciate you saying it that way so much. And I think, you know, one thing you were touching on before is why do we use this term objective function? Yes. Like when we talk about the concept of purpose, why don't we just use the word purpose? Um, and there are a bunch of reasons for this, but let's just jump into what objective function actually means. Go for it. When you are creating like a math equation or a computer program, right? The, a, an objective function is a function, like a math equation is a function. Um, with a specific objective, with a thing that it's trying to maximize, right? So you can think about an equation on one side and then what you want that equation to maximize on the other side, right? Yes. And that equation in our lives is the environmental stimuli, the inputs we get in any situation. And then the objective function is meant to transform that set of stimuli into a clear and concise answer. In other words, you input mm. life and you output whatever your objective function yeah, is. Yeah, you output right. your actions. And the right. objective function is a function in between the inputs and the outputs. Um, and the reason mm. we don't say purpose is a few. One is purpose typically is used to describe like a single achievable thing you want from life, like a single thing that has value. Um, where a function can be a lot of things that are weighted. It can be like, you know, personal happiness, but my personal happiness is like three times more valuable to me than the happiness of others. But the happiness of others is still valuable to me. But I also still value, you know, other things at different weights. Yeah. And by taking all those weights and all of those things you think have value in life, you can get a clear answer. Um, and where another reason we don't use the word purpose is a nihilist really can't have a purpose. But a nihilist can have an objective function. You know, Mm. a a nihilist still has some set of heuristics Mm -hmm. that they use to determine um, what to do in any given what to do in any given moment. You know, when they're deciding, do I take the time to study for this exam that's coming up or do I go out and have fun with my friends? There is some sort of equation in their brain that's making that decision. Or at least you hope there is and you hope control over. it. Yeah. And that they're not just running on autopilot. What I think you realize is that this show is about beginning a conversation. That's why from week to week, we're sharing the stories and insights, the wisdom and the practices that come out of these interviews and these extraordinary guests, because it's about how do we move that forward? So how do we continue that conversation specifically to see how this can make a meaningful difference in our lives and in our relationships and within our careers? This is about taking it forward not allowing these episodes to just be a moment in time, but to allow them to really truly begin to affect your life. And so I want to invite you to join One Idea Away. And don't worry, the membership is free. Just go to oneideaaway.com forward slash join. You see, when you do that, you're going to get access to a couple of things. First is that every single week you will get that, that correspondence, the email from us to let you know what's going on. But in it, I share different uh, personal stories and insights, things that are going on for me on a day-to-day and week-to-week basis. And so you're going to start to glean some things that are maybe some behind the, theme, you know, behind the scenes stuff that's going on with the show. You're going to hear a little bit more of some of the work that I've even done with my clients that I'm now exposing through these emails and these newsletters. And what it's also attached to is kind of number two, which is that we're releasing these weekly momentum builders, these connection exercises that allow you to take these concepts, these practices, some of the lessons you learn on 
this show as well and apply them to your life to take them deeper to reflect on them more deeply than ever before so it does make that meaningful difference what you're also going to do is get an invite to our private facebook group where the whole community of one idea away so the listeners of the show as well as the contributors we have on our website uh, all of the members that we've got as part of this community continue this conversation on that day-to-day and week-to-week basis including offering support to one another you'll get invited to that group you can also find that group by just searching up one idea away community on uh, facebook and look specifically for the private group. The last thing you're going to do is that when you join, you're going to continually get these invites to the monthly live cast that we've also begun. These are deeper conversations where we get into it with community members, we get into it with experts, and we move the conversation forward from multiple directions on different topics, whether it be on purpose or relationships or career or meaning. And we really dive that down deep. And you've got the chance to interact by posing your questions to us, throw it in there through Facebook and make sure that we are helping you in a way that really benefits your life, benefits your career and your relationships. And so do me a favor, go to oneideaway.com forward slash join. I really invite you to get involved. And last but not least, do it because I would love to connect with you. It's so meaningful for me to know how this is touching you, how this is reaching you, and also what would help you even more. So do me a favor, join in, uh, join that private Facebook group, get in touch with me, ask me your questions, and I would love to continue to support you through this show as well as through the One Idea Away community. Thanks so much, and now I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Let me, let me give everybody this, this additional analogy because I, I, I love a distinction, again, that you guys are making here is that uh, part of society for too long has always been focused on the output, right? We think we mm-hmm. can somehow control the result that's at the end of the equation without paying respect to the equation. So part of it has been results only focus. That's not going to work. You're not going to get to where you think yeah. you want to go. Now, at the same time, taking a look at only the inputs doesn't actually control things because it's the manufacturing process that's in the middle that's actually going to determine mm-hmm. how those inputs turn into the output that you desire. Yeah. So, right. And it's like so ethical manufacturing, you're building an ethical mm, factory in your brain. Right. Right. So then how, how do we, cause you talk a lot about like, you know, figuring out what the intrinsic value is and you give us all sorts of different scenarios and, and, and different things to be able to think through. What, what is that beginning point for somebody to really truly understand what is this manufacturing process? What is this equation going to be based on meaning how do we really truly identify that objective function it could start with your standard of evidence because i think that's what a lot of your initial logical thought processes around what objective function you want to have for yourself come from Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of people will say that scientific consensus or you know scientific studies you know really well vetted research or their top standard of Yeah, evidence. so that's what they use to determine what's real and what's not real. Other people will say, no, it's, it's actually what I witness personally. So if right. I see that scientific studies say ghosts don't exist, but then I see a ghost, I'm going to believe that ghosts exist. But mm-hmm. another person who, who holds scientific studies to a greater, or scientific consensus to a greater value would say, oh, I must be having a psychiatric episode right now. Yeah. Mm. Or, you know, let's say, I mean, you could even use uh, the Bible as as your point of reference. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it really depends on that mm. basis because okay. it's how you determine what's real and what's not real. And it's interesting, you know, so many people, and, and, and if you've chosen sort of your standard of evidence, you know, make sure you have looked within this standard of evidence for evidence that you may be wrong about something you believe. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, I guess these people who just, you know, use the Bible, the standard of evidence, it really isn't that hard for them. And it's like, no, it really is. You know, even for them, they need to go through line by line and make sure they aren't just believing what other people are telling them the Bible. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. But it's, it's such a, it plays such a key role in that logical thought process, right? Because you start by the basics, right? Why, why am I here? Mm-hmm. Okay. So like we could mm-hmm. look at what science says, we could look at what we feel, we could look at what uh, your neighbor said, we could look at what the Bible says. Yeah. They all have different answers. And yeah. without that standard of evidence, you're kind of lost. You know, you're going to, you're going to fudge around with things forever. Never comes to a conclusion. So it's, it's that balance between, you know, asking those questions of, why am I here? And I will point out a specific uh, a specific point of emphasis is the word I. Why am mm-hmm. I here? So that you do make this very, very personal. And you've got to be able to balance that 
in in terms of where do you draw your evidence meaning what do you where do you draw your truth where do you draw your facts where do you draw the the things that say this is what i will allow to influence the way that i i think the way that i process uh etc so those two things it sounds like they they've got to they've got to harmonize for for yeah. for people to really understand how they they relate to one another yeah. Well, and even the word either, I, I think it's interesting that you highlighted that because mm. that can also really influence what your objective function is. If you define I as just the consciousness that thinks that right. you kind of hear thinking, that's yeah. one thing. You could also define it as my family or my closest yeah. kin. You could define it as the human race. I could, yeah. or your you could brain. define it as carbon-based life forms. You could, yeah. Or, or, your body, or, or a or small, your... well, you, you could define I like, you know, uh, if you asked, a, you know, one of my blood cells, who are you? Yeah. It might say, well, I'm part of Malcolm, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you ask a person, a person might say, well, I'm a blood cell, or they might say, I'm part of the human race, or I'm something that exists within the physical universe. Or, or I'm an American. Or yeah, or yeah. I'm an American. And that can determine how you conceive of the concept of self. Absolutely. And your concept of self influences what you think has value enormously. Yeah. Well, as soon as as soon as we begin to create those definitions, uh, you know, saying it in slightly different words, is that when we create those definitions, we create those labels for how we're even going to descri describe I, that mm -hmm. means we are something and we are not something else. Mm -hmm. And so it mm -hmm. starts to, to, to create that differentiation, start to create that type of uniqueness, but it also emphasizes why it's so important for us to choose that consciously, intentionally, yeah. deliberately, not just because society told us so or culture so, that, you know, et cetera. So yeah. the next thing that I thought was really interesting is that let's say we, we uncover that, that core value for us, that, that this is what I would say is my objective function. This is what I am orienting myself to. The next thing that you guys go to is this ideological tree. And I was hoping you could say just a little bit more about what this is, uh, because it, it, it was a, the way that you guys frame it is a little different than how most people may understand it. Okay, so if you consider your objective function as like the root, like the core function of what you're trying to achieve, your objective function doesn't determine your actions or anything like that. It determines what you should want to achieve if you are acting optimally. Mm -hmm. You know, if your objective function is just, let's say, 100% helping other people maximize their positive emotional states, you know, that doesn't mean that that's what you're going to do. Yeah, you still have to build a game plan. You still have yeah. to build a game plan for achieving that. And your game plan can be wrong. Yeah. And yeah. your ideological tree is a, a sort of tree of hypotheses you have about the way the world works that exist with root hypotheses and then branch hypotheses that assume the correctness of these root hypotheses. Like here's a kind of fun mm -hmm. one. You could say that I, you know, my hypothesis, I want to make people happy. That's my objective function. My hypothesis is, okay, I think by giving people a more comfortable modern society in which they're free from pain and sickness and and struggle and they have leisure, then they'll be maximally happy. And then let's say that you you somehow build that society really miraculously. But then we get to that point where you kind of alluded to this in the beginning, where people have this society that's allows them to have leisure and they're comfortable and they're not sick. They're not struggling to survive. And now we're having these existential crises and yeah. maybe you're less happy. So then maybe you would find evidence that suggests that your hypothesis was wrong. It appears that making people, um, you know, free of normal human problems and full of leisure doesn't actually make them happier. So now you have to develop a new hypothesis, well, but it will change. Talk about base hypotheses that most people have. You know, if you're, if you're one of the most classic base hypotheses we use is your political beliefs. Like, is communism the best way to make people happy or is, you know, capitalism the best way right. to make the maximum number of people happy? That is something that at least within a given geography and a given time period, there is a correct answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you should look for evidence that your belief on that is wrong because it sort of ch branches out and changes all of your actions. Like right. one that our society sort of accepts is obviously true, but I think of if examined with any credulity just doesn't really hold up is equality. Equality makes right. people happier. Um, and, or equality is, is somehow just this, this generic good thing that's going to achieve every potential objective function. But I think when you really begin to investigate it and begin to investigate the research, um, you may see that while our society just says, oh, this is an obviously true thing, it doesn't hold up as well. Yeah. Well, it, it raised, and I, I, you know, you, you, you had this wonderful list of questions around the idea of equality and fairness uh, at one point, in the, yeah. or examples within the book. And 
it's, you know, how do you define equality? How do you define fairness in any manner that is not relative? Yeah, we, right. we, we took that example from a book called Policy Paradox by Deborah Stone, okay. uh, in which she she presents this this scenario in which a professor brings a cake to a class and right. needs to divide it equally. And then there's this big series of questions. OK, how do we divide it equally? We could do it by who arrived first, who gets the best grades, who's the most hungry, who's the most disadvantaged, who likes the teacher the most, who the teacher likes the most. Who's the hardest working, who has the highest <laughs> caloric needs? And then it's like, OK, well, then men get more than women, you know, um, and and all of these things, you know, the all of those to, divisions are fair. Y- right. Yeah, all, all of them are fair. And you have this this, you know, people who say, oh, I want equality are like. Oh, you know, from each according to their their ability to each according to their needs, you know, that sort of classic. Yeah. But in the end, it's words. more about getting the most for their tribe. But but it's but it's it's a harder question than that. It's a harder question yes. than that. Quality is not a simple thing and it is not a simple concept. And if you're trying to maximize it, you need to very clearly define it. And then ask yourself why you've chosen to define it that way. Is it yeah. about justifying your past actions and past beliefs? Did you mm. define it that way so that you don't need to feel like an ass for being wrong? Right. Or did you need to define it that way because uh, it maximizes benefit to your particular tribe or subgroup? Or did you define it that way because logically that's what you really believe? Yeah, and I really think the majority of people will find that when they say equality, what they really mean is a redistribution of power or resources towards their favored group. Right, right. Well, I I think it's when when people begin to look beneath the hood of what they believe to be equal. uh, We don't want to face the fact that most of us have this definition that it's equal, but some things are more equal than others. Uh, it did, did not go totally Orwellian on us, but you know, it, it, unfortunately, when we start to look at this and investigate it, and I think this is the thing that was really interesting about this, building out that ideological tree, the, the belief tree, and looking at what is the core, the roots of what's going on there, is that as we get out and experience more or wherever we draw our evidence from, whatever it is we read, et cetera, we're looking for not just what affirms where we're going, where might we be wrong, where might be, would we be incomplete, Where might we be contradictory so that we can investigate and continually, I think you even referred to it as as, uh, pruning the the ideological tree, right? And so we're constantly refining. And every once in a while, we may realize, you know what, we might be missing a root or that root might actually need to go in a different direction or, or might be redefined in some way for us to really grow into our our um objective functioning the way that we really want it to. Now, I just wanted to, to, to kind of, you know, cram in, so to speak, because we, you know, I do want to, I do want to watch our time, but I want to get these other two elements in because I think this is now where we go from that objective function we orient ourselves towards. We build this belief system and we build it and we build it and refine it and refine it so that it, it, it takes off, but from that very, very core root that's there. But then these next two things are really, really interesting because I think this is where it's the, the, that rubber meeting the road, so to speak, where you talk about determining your own uh, personal identity or internal character. And I was hoping you could say more about that. And then we'll get to the last piece because that was also a, a different perspective than most people are going to be used to hearing. So just to take a step back here, let's talk a little bit about internal character and how this works. So somebody comes up to you and they say something that, you know, you find insulting and then, you know, you start yelling at them uh, or you, you get angry at them or whatever and you raise your voice. This whole exchange is not something where at any part during that exchange did you reference, what do I want to achieve from this interaction? How am I going to achieve that thing? What do I think has value? What do I think is ethical? You know, and this sort of interaction is the way we live most of our life. Yeah. And we call this sort of your autopilot. Yes. And your autopilot is created by a self image you have of yourself. It is the way sort of that you expect yourself to react when presented with certain stimuli. And it is the way that you want to see yourself. And we will go to enormous lengths to see ourselves in a specific way, you know, especially people who aren't really thinking they're just sort of running in this autopilot mode. Mm -hmm. And even no matter how lucid you are, you're still in autopilot 90% of the time. Yeah. So when you have these moments of lucidity, your goal should be to study and learn how to rewrite your autopilot, rewrite this self-identity so that when somebody comes up to you and, you know, insults you or whatever, you react in the way you would want to react on autopilot if you weren't on autopilot, if you had actually sought through everything. 
Yeah. And so in this section, we sort of train you how to brainwash yourself <laughs> into the kind of person who reacts the way you want to react. And so many people, they hear that and they go, what you're saying, not be who you really are. And it's like, look, who you really are is a sticky ball that was rolling down the street and picked up a bunch of dirt from random serendipity. And, and you're holding this sticky ball and you say, this is who I really am because of all this random serendipity. And we're saying, no, you can choose what stuck to that ball. You can wash that ball off and cover it with glitter if you want to. And then the question is, is who you really are. Are you more you yeah. if you allow yourself to be who you've become through serendipity and accidents? Or, or are you more you if you decide who you want to be and create that person? And that's something that different people will have different thoughts on. But we think that you're much less you if you've allowed other people to create you. Right. So what we're what we're really beginning to do, I mean, again, I'll go back to that 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 brief analogy we, we said of of the kind of the manufacturing process that happens to be here. Us as humans, it's part of human nature. There's a lot of us that is automated process, uh, whether we want to take a look at that or not. It's true. And so what you're describing is that, OK, up until now, we've been taking a that strategic leadership and management view of the manufacturing process so that we're designing it with intention. And now it's a matter of, OK, now how do we specifically design these processes because they're going to run automated? Yeah. And this is how we begin to install it. So because we can't be 100 percent conscious 100 percent of the time, it's not how it works for us as human beings. Yeah. So this is a really, really deliberate process to, to make that happen. Now, the, the last portion, which I thought was really interesting, was around this idea of determining your public identity and you frame it by the question of how do I want others to think of me? And I thought that was interesting because on the one hand, we, we do this by nature. We, we are thinking about what is it that other people think about me. And at the same time, some of the, the, you know, the, the pop culture, pop psychology out there is, oh, you need to think you know, less about what people think of you. What do you really mean here? Uh, well, first off, I mean, the, it's really interesting when I hear the question, what do I want people to think of me? The obvious human instinct reaction is I want people to like and admire and fear me. And ultimately, what we advocate is y we want people to think of you in a way that helps to serve your objective function. And that involves creating a predictable character that's like a highlights reel of your real identity mm -hmm. that both includes nice things and predictable flaws that are not deal breakers for your objective function. So there should be things you present mm -hmm. to the world that are attractive and alluring and that people like about you that are very predictable, but they, there should also be negative things so that when people need to figure out in their minds mm -hmm. what's wrong with you, because they will decide what's wrong with you, you've chosen what they decide is wrong with you. And, and when we talk about that generic response that everyone has is, well, I want people to like and admire me. It's like, well, that may not be what is best for achieving your specific goal at this time, you know, whether it's a promotion in your office or anything like that, you know, no matter what you want from life, almost always it matters what other people think of you. And yeah. the generic response people have is, well, I want people to see me for who I really am. Yeah. You know, I want people to see this internal code I've written about who I'm going to be, and I'm just going to project <laughs> that to the world. And the analogy we use in the book is that's like, you know, you have programmed a word processing software, right? And you're trying to sell it in a store. And the programmer is there saying, but I want to put the, the processor's code on the box. Um, and then everyone will know exactly what the software really is. Right. And it's like, no, if every word processing software just had the code on the box, it would all basically look the same to everyone because it would be too nuanced, too complicated. And most of it would be the same anyway. Yeah. What people want to see is how you are different from other products and how you are different from other products in a way that relates to their interaction with you. Yes, they want to see the picture of Clippy or the lack of Clippy. They want to see the spell check feature. That's it. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think I think it's, you know, it raises something really interesting is that, that you know, we, we talk about the, the common response of what do we want other people to, to think of me? I want to be loved. I want to be admired. I want respect. I want to be feared. I want to be seen for who I am. And I'm going to add a, a one other statement that I have found really starts to hone in to me of part of what you're saying is that behind all those other things, the gateway for it is I want to be understood. And what you guys are talking about is how do we make sure the way that we are showing ourselves to others gives them the understanding that we want them to have so that we can continue to go after our objective function. And you're just talking about, again, being deliberate. 
It's nothing, nothing more than that, right? And that's, I guess, that's part of what I just want to reemphasize to everybody. Yeah. This is just about being very conscious and deliberate about how we do this. It's not, you know, it's not anything other than that. Um, it's just we don't pay enough attention to doing this. I, you know, I actually want to unpack a little of what you said because I think sure. it's very insightful. Is when we say we want to be understood, like when we have that thought, what we really mean is we want other people to see us the way we see ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the way we always function on autopilot. Yeah. But when we really focus on that, do I really need other people? Do I really gain anything from other people seeing me the way I see myself? Often the answer is no, not really. I mean, I get some some positive emotional output from that, but nothing more valuable than that. Right. And, and again, it allows you even just where you're going right there, it allows us to start to even look into our own motivations of what is it that we really want to be understood? What are we getting out of that? What is the benefit that we receive from that? And I think that's just the, the really interesting thing that this, this kind of whole process uh, really starts to bring to light is it's like you're walking around with a mirror. You're walking around with this huge book of questions at any given time so that you're reflecting on and you're intentionally processing, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? How does this, you know, help me fulfill what it is that I really want most in my life or career, uh, et cetera. And it's just a deliberate process, but a challenging one mm -hmm. at that, because this is hard work. These are not easy answers that we come to. <laughs> and so I just, I really appreciate what you guys are bringing to light through this. And I guess maybe to bring us around, uh, you know, sort of full circle on this conversation. One of the things that, that we really like people to take away from this show is, you know, when we talk about one idea away, this interview, this conversation we're having should be the beginning point. It, it's not meant to be, hey, I got inspired or got an idea for 14, for 45 minutes, and so be it. It's meant to begin something. And so I'm curious for, for, for both of you, what is it that you hope that the work that you're bringing into the world through the book and, and your foundation, the other things that you're doing, what's sort of that ripple effect or that additional conversation that you hope flows from what you're up to? I mean, our long-term goal is uh, the reason we have the foundation, the reason we're, we're working on this. I mean, the reason we earn money and put it back into these projects is because we, we think that society needs to be changed right now. Uh, we don't like the direction society is going in. People are just reacting. We are not educated in a way that provides us with the mental tools necessary to change our minds on, on things that are important to us. Mm -hmm. And and, and if anything in society needs to be fixed, that needs to be fixed. We need to learn how to change our minds. Um, and that's mm. the whole reason we created such an intentional process. Because when you have an intentional process like this, when I know what someone else is trying to achieve, their objective function, and I know their hypotheses, and I know their standard of evidence, then I can meaningfully engage with them on, for example, a more nuanced political topic and yeah. say, okay, you believe this, this, and this, here's why you're wrong about that. And then they say, oh, I see. Um, that actually is a standard of evidence that I respect, and I'm willing to change my mind based on that standard of evidence. The reason why we don't try to push people down any specific path, just make them create rules for themselves, is as soon as you have this set of rules that you've created for yourself, you are now free to use those rules to change your opinion and your mind on things. Yeah. And we are not taught how to do this. And being no. not taught how to do this, society is going to crack. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Simone, any, Simone anything that you would like to, to add to Malcolm's uh, reply? No, he nailed it. We're just <laughs> more concerned about where things are going. And we think we're totally capable of changing it, uh, that the human race can change. Yes. Well, we're extraordinary a creation. Look at what we've created. Mm -hmm. It may not be working out the way that we planned, but we can bring, you know, extraordinary things to to uh, to manifest, as it were, and, and, and reality of, of this life. And so now we just need to take a look at how do we be more deliberate? How do we be more conscious? of creating something a little different than we have right now. And I absolutely love that notion that at the heart of this is helping people understand how is it that you change your minds and how is it that you even decided what's in your mind in the first place. So Simone and Malcolm, I wanna thank you so much for this just incredibly uh, kind of far ranging as well as intriguing conversation today on One Idea Away. Thank you for uh, the book, what you guys are up to in the world and just, I really appreciate it. This has been a blast, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. For everyone, I, you know, I do want to, again, encourage you to check out The Pragmatist's Guide to Life. Again, this was Simone and Malcolm Collins. Uh, you know, I guess maybe the thing that I just, I'll, I'll go back to and, and emphasize, this is about us being really, really intentional about the, the life philosophy, the life orientation that we end up choosing to have. Because the more that we get conscious of what that is, we know how we orient ourselves. And the more conscious we get to the process of how we fulfill that, how we bring that into reality, how that shapes who it is that we are, the more we become aware of that process, the more that we can understand who we are and how we truly become fulfilled, the more that we can take a look at what is the new evidence that's always emerging that I should be reprocessing and considering what does this mean to me and what I believe. And the more that we understand all of this, the more we may actually begin to understand each other as well. And that leads to a very different conversation and potentially a different reality. So with that, I want to thank you as always for dropping in on one idea away. And until we talk again, continue to enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you really enjoyed it, do me a favor, let us know. You can keep the conversation going and send us a message on our Facebook page, which is simply one idea away. Go ahead and tag me in the post or even just direct messages. Also, I would be incredibly grateful if you could share this episode along with someone that you believe could benefit from hearing the ideas and the messages that we got into. That's pretty much why we do this. So you can just go ahead and share it from your app or email it along, whatever works for you. The point is, is to share, to talk, to discuss and keep the dialogue going because it's in those conversations that ideas can take hold and create profound shifts in perspective. That's what allows us to live life more fully, deeply, and consciously. As always, we would love to see you post a review for the podcast and iTunes or whichever app you're using. And until next time, remember, you're never more than one idea away from a whole new reality. This is Luke Iorio and One Idea Away, signing off.